Our scripture reading this morning comes from the lectionary, and we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. We're continuing in this Gospel, and today we come to chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. In this particular reading, we find the Lord's Prayer uh, as, as Luke presents it. It's a little bit different from Matthew's. Uh, Matthew is the version that uh, we feature our prayer on, that we, we pray each week, that's printed in our bulletin today. Uh, and that's mainly from Matthew, and we add on a little bit at the end that's from the tradition of the church, but it's uh, mainly from Matthew's gospel. Luke's gospel takes a little bit different prayer in that it's the same material, it's just a shortened or truncated version of it, and so we're not sure if he uh, had the other material or not, or if that's the prayer that his community uh, uh, prayed on a regular basis and may have been just a little bit different from Matthew's. But in any event, I invite you to attend to the reading of the word. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give, e give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers you from within, Do not bother me, the door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather and we worship you this morning. We each come in our own ways, with our own needs, in our own context. We know that you speak to us, to each of us, within that context. And so as we pray, and as we worship, and as we meditate on your word this morning, we'd ask that your words would speak to each of us, to our own needs specifically. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Paul Harvey tells a story about a young mother who had a three-year-old child that she had to take to the grocery store. Um, some of you may be there now, and some of you may remember what that was like. Um, it's uh, quite an experience, and so she was kind of gearing up for this journey to the store, and she asked him specifically not to make a fuss about chocolate chip cookies. She said, we've got all the cookies we need. We don't need any more cookies. I'm not buying you cookies at the store, so please know you're not getting any cookies. So they went to the store, and there they were shopping, and they came, of course, to the cookie aisle, and they're going down the aisle. He'd forgotten all about what she said, and he said, Mom, Mom, please, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? And she said, no, I told you about this. We're not having chocolate chip cookies today. And she managed to get out of the aisle without any cookies being deposited in the basket. Well, as she was making her way, she remembered she forgot something, and she had to go back down that aisle. So, oh, here we go. So she was trying to hurry, and he saw him again. And, oh, Mom, please, here we are. There they are. Can we just have the cookies? There? We can just grab them and go. And No, we're not getting any cookies today. So she got out of the aisle again, and she was finishing up with the grocery shopping, and she's in line to check out, and the little boy realized that his time to get cookies was quickly closing. <laughs> and so he stood up in the basket, and he loudly declared, in the name of Jesus, please, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? Well, the, all the 
people that were there in the grocery store erupting in laughter and applause and uh, do you think he got his cookies? Not from the mom, but the other shoppers rallied around to his cause and he left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies. Oh, I'm not sure what that's teaching him. And about prayer, but I think it reflects on sometimes what we think about prayer a lot of the time. Uh, Luke talks about persistence in prayer in today's gospel. And, and as Jesus tells us to be persistent in our prayers, sometimes we hear this and we relate it. And we're once again transported back to when we were three, wanting the cookies. Because we think the future unfolds before us for all that we can see. And we say, oh, if I could pray for anything I wanted and I just need to be persistent in this prayer, it's kind of wide open, isn't it? And we can envision our future and imagine what all the possibilities that I could have. We imagine sometimes to be God to be kind of like that cosmic vending machine, and if we just keep pressing A7, you know, we just keep praying for it, eventually that is going to pop out, and we're going to get what we want. And that may not be what Jesus is talking about when he talks about be persistent in your prayer life. Because what we do is we couch our persistence in prayer in the previous prayer that Jesus has just taught us, the Lord's Prayer. And that is what we must be persistent in, in that kind of praying, and to see how that shapes our lives. It's interesting, as we look at uh, Luke's version, it starts out uh, very simply, Father, hallowed be your name, we praise God. And then it says, your kingdom come. It's a little bit truncated from Matthew's version, uh, on earth as it is in heaven. It's just your kingdom come. It's, it's direct and to the point. And so it's like we want to follow God's will. We want God's kingdom to come. And so how do we go about doing that? Well, we continue along the prayer. And we see the next line is give us each day our daily bread. And so this kind of reminds us for what the Hebrew or Israelite people went through in the desert. You remember when they were wandering around with Moses? And they were looking for the promised land, and they were hungry, and so God gave them manna from heaven, and it would come each day. And they were not supposed to gather it up for the next day, just for their daily need. It was all that they were supposed to gather. Do you remember what would happen if they kept it? Do you remember? It spoiled. That's right. It would start to stink. So if your neighbor cheated... You would know because their tent would stink. And you say, oh, well, I, we know what you've been. You've gathered too much. You don't trust God to supply your daily need. And so the idea was um, that we should trust God each day for what we need for that day. And so Jesus' prayer reflects that, that you and I are to trust God for our daily need and to recognize that God walks in this life beside us each and every day. God does not take a day off. Uh, God is there for us every day. And so it's important that we realize that and receive that out of that prayer when we're praying for our daily bread. So now the next line has to do with forgiveness, but it's conditional. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. A lot of times we talk about God's unconditional love and grace for us, and that is important for us to recognize that. This prayer, however, is not unconditional. As we look for God's mercy, we recognize that a part of that condition is that we are to extend the same mercy we're looking for to others. Why do we, what does Jesus put this piece in the prayer on forgiveness? It's interesting. I think it may be so that you and I might truly understand the mercy being extended to us. Have you ever had to forgive someone that really hurt you? Or you're injured by that person? It's not easy, is it? Sometimes it's a work in progress, and you may not be done with that work yet. You may be on the journey towards forgiveness. And other times we just set it aside and think, I'll never forgive that person. I'll never be able to. And yet that kind of works on us. It's like a poison in us if we let it sit and fester, and it's not good for us to not forgive. Jesus knew that, and he put that in the prayer so that when we finally get to the point 
of forgiving the person, what do we receive? We find that when we are able to forgive, at least I do, when I'm finally able to forgive someone, a sense of peace and well-being comes over me, and I feel better, and I find that that is, provides healing for that injury or wound that I've been carrying around all this time, and I realize I've needed to do this. And I don't know if you've ever thought this, but I've thought that sometimes, why did I not forgive them sooner? I think we need to forgive others so that we may fully understand the mercy and the grace that has been extended to us in Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the final verse, and do not bring us to the time of trial. There's been a little bit of controversy over this, uh, where we say in our version, uh, lead us not into temptation. And Pope Francis had... Uh, it was in the news in June about this when the Catholic Church kind of changed this wording and he said, do not abandon us to temptation. And this was only for the Italian Catholics. So if you are a Catholic here today or online with us, uh, you don't have to worry about anything if you're English speaking Catholics. They still do the regular Lord's Prayer. But the Italian Catholics are changing it up a little bit. And it's the idea that we don't want to confuse our understanding theologically about what God is doing here. It's not that God is testing us or bringing us to trial. It's that God strengthens us for this journey so that when we face tests or trials, we have the strength and forbearance to get past it, to move past it. So it kind of brings us, I think, to the point of today's congregational prayer, which was by Teresa of Avila. And it's that idea of getting behind God's understanding for our life and getting our will to coincide with God's will. And this is the part of the prayer I really like. She writes, Do not punish us, we beseech you, by granting that which we wish or ask, if it offend your love, which would always live in, the, in us. What that kind of reminds us is that idea that uh, if our will is not God's will, that is likely dangerous for us. It's like when we want to eat too many chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> and we think that that's good for us, and we want to just do that, and we want to just binge. And we realize that's not healthy for us. There are lots and lots of things in our lives that kind of coincide with that idea, so that our will should coincide with God's will. We ask God, do not bring us to the time of trial. Do not lead us into temptation. Let us do what you would have us do. It's important for us to understand that. And so that's Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. It seems very simple, and yet it's direct and to the point and covers uh, quite a lot for us. And we come back to that idea of persistence. Persistence in prayer. And when we want to pray for something consistently and persistently and have that as a part of our lives, it's important that our will coincide with God's will as presented in the Lord's Prayer. And when those two things align, I think we're more likely to find out that our prayers are being answered in ways that we would like. Now the difficult piece for this, for us, is when we are dealing with illness or suffering. And not only ourselves, but someone we love. So that when a loved one is dealing with suffering and we pray persistently for their healing, sometimes we wonder, why does that not happen? Doesn't that align with God's will that healing and wholeness be a part of everyone's life? We'd say, yes, that certainly should align. And yet sometimes we know that relatives suffer, and sometimes the suffering lingers, and then sometimes they die. And at these points, I think we're so fixated on this particular life, and we are fixated on the inevitability of death, that we forget our Christian faith that talks about resurrection and new life. And that just as there is an inevitability of death, there is an inevitability of resurrection and life, that it continues to happen and spring forward again and again and again. It's difficult to see it in the moment, 
But it's important for our faith to recognize that and to hold on to that. Now, Ed Dobson is the pastor of Calvary Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he suffers with ALS. And he says that he has muscle atrophy in his right arm and right hand and nerve damage, and sometimes he twitches in his muscles all over his body. He says there's a remote possibility that the disease could remain localized in his arm, in which case it wouldn't kill him. So he says, I've got three prayers in dealing with my illness and healing for that. He says, a small faith vision, a medium faith vision, and a large faith vision. He says, when my faith is small, he says, this is what I pray for. Lord, I'll give up my right hand. Just let the disease stop there. In other words, as it continues to progress, if I have to lose my right arm completely, that'll be okay. He says, when my, if I have a medium faith, I'm a little stronger, this is what I pray. Lord, stop it right where it is. Let it get no worse than it is today. And I'd be okay with that. He says, if I'm feeling particularly bold, I pray, maybe you could heal me, Lord. In fact, maybe you could reverse this disease. One night he asked his friend, who was a former pastor of First Assembly, to anoint him with oil for healing. And they got to talking about how he's done this before and how some people, when anointed with oil, find healing in their lives, and then some do not. And he said, for those who find healing, he said, the important thing is that you need to get lost in the wonder of God. If you get lost in that wonder, who knows what God will do for you? And this is what Ed Dobson chose to understand about that. He said that if I get lost in the love of God and the faithfulness of God and the power of God, if I focus not on the healing, but rather on the healer, then watch out. See, I've found that this is a very powerful perspective when I pray. It's difficult for in the midst of suffering to have that perspective. When I was in Drummond, my first appointment, there was a woman who was very faithful and she developed cancer and she asked us to pray for her for healing. And we had a little prayer circle in the sanctuary one, uh, one day. We had our chairs kind of circled up and, and we were pray all took turns praying for her. When I prayed for her, I remember her interrupting my prayer for healing for her life. And she said, if it be your will, praying to God, if this be your will for healing. And what she understood was that she wanted healing and she wanted us to pray for that. She was the one requesting it. But she also knew Sometimes that doesn't happen. And that this might be something that leads to not only the end of this particular life, but the beginning of the life eternal. And she said, if that is the case, I'm okay with that. Or at least, I want to be okay with that. And I want to be in a place where I'm okay with that. And that's what our faith does. It allows us to remind us, it reminds us that even though death may come, that life and resurrection also comes. And that as we pray for healing for our lives, we pray for our daily bread. Sometimes we pray for strength for the day. And we recognize that God walks along beside us. The Lord's Prayer starts out Father, but the translation from Aramaic is Abba, which is the word that a little child would use for God, for, for a daddy, for a papa. And so as Jesus uses that word, Abba, it reminds us to think of God as this loving parent who wraps the divine arms of love and mercy and grace around us, who walks with us day by day, who never lets go of our hand as we walk, even though sometimes we seek to jerk away, that God continues to walk with us on this path of life. And that as we persevere in prayer, Sometimes we recognize the wonder that God is with us. And we know that when this life ends, 
that God doesn't release our hand, but continues to walk with us into the life eternal. When we can have this kind of assurance of faith through a perseverance of prayer, sometimes this allows us to look around and recognize that we've had the chocolate chip cookies all along. 